Hello folks and uh, welcome back to episode 2 of our Ben Skellig's Remembered uh, History of Ben Skellig series. Today, I hope you enjoyed the first episode and in today's episode we are concentrating on Ben Skellig's cable station and the history of the transatlantic cable and also on Cable O'Leary and how Cable O'Leary came to be. Um, Michal O'Lein will talk you talk you through the uh, history of the Ben and Skellig's cable station and that will be followed by Anne Coffey doing reading uh, her father's version of the Cable O'Leary story. So enjoy. Thank you. Um, now for this episode we are going to do a little feature on the cable station in Ben Skelligs. Now towards the end of the 19th century uh, South Kerry became the hub of transatlantic communication and we had three independent cable stations here in South Kerry in the Ivra Peninsula, one in Valencia, one here in Ben Skelligs and one in uh, Waterford. Now prior to the development of transatlantic the, the transatlantic cable, when um, communication was needed between Europe and America, between Amer uh, between the um, United Kingdom and America, it had to be done by ship. And that was a slow process. Then, um, at the start of the 19th century, 1820s and 30s, you had um, certain developments which pushed on the need for a quicker means of communication. And um, that was mainly the Industrial Revolution and the development of financial markets in London. So, um, and at the same time, you had a lot of developments with um, telegraphy and electricity. Now, um, it was reasonably, it, at that stage, it was, um, uh, telecommunications over land was developed, but it was a more difficult thing to do it under water. But with the, advent, the invention of a substance or a product known as um, Gotta Persia, uh, it became possible to put uh, cables, uh, telecommunication cables, on the water. Now, Gotta Persia was um, a form of insulation that could be put around the cable so that the cable could be placed on the water. And that was uh, successfully tried and tested in um, 1851 between um, Calais and Dover. But taking a cable across the Atlantic was a different kettle of fish and would much more complicated. And after a few failed efforts, um, it was uh, a cable was successfully laid uh, between Hearts Content and Valencia Island in the year um, 1866. So that proved that the laying of a cable across the Atlantic could be done and consequently other companies um, got into the, uh, into the role of um, uh, laying cables across the Atlantic. One of those companies was known as by the initials DUST, D-U-S-T, um, Direct United States um, Telegraph. And that company decided to lay a cable between um, Tar Bay in Halifax, Nova Scotia and Balanskelix here. And that process took place in 1873 and the cable station was opened in 1874. Now the cable itself was manufactured by the German company uh, Siemens and it was laid across the Atlantic by a liner, a fisher, um, a big ship known as the Faraday. Cables, the cable was laid and it was run then by dust for a number of years. And then uh, that company, Direct United States Telegraph, it amalgamated with the Villinger Company, Anglo-American, and it formed um, a cartel uh, known as uh, PQ cartel. You know, the, the, the advantage of a cartel was that they were able to set their prices and income and then that uh, 
position continued until 1895. Then in 1911, the Western Union took over the running of Allen Skellig's cable station. That had been, um, uh, and it, it had also been um, running the Villinger cable station. So the, the Villinger and Allen Skellig's cable station, they were connected by land and by sea. And that position uh, continued until 1920. Now, as we all know from uh, at the moment, this, the, the War of Independence uh, was going on from eight, uh, 1918 um, until 1921-22, and the British government needed a secure post office for, um, for, secu for security reasons. So they took over uh, the cable station here in Balanskelix and ran it as a post office until um, 1923. And then, um, uh, after 1923, the Irish government took over the, the building and um, ran it as a, an Irish college. Now, as I said there earlier, the ship that laid the cable was known as the Faraday. Now, that was a big liner, and it could not enter into uh, uh, Balanskelix Bay. Uh, another process was engaged in to bring the, the cable ashore. Now, Ta Kuntas on the Yas, Er Kunas Marahanig on Kabla Idir, on Ovihal Ikirvik, Agus Tashe Skrite in the Laurige, Agus Ta Aine, Ikofik, Kun on Lerkashina who are doing Inish. So, Fakame Fut Inishi Aine. And my father wrote about the Balan Skellix cable station in Skellix calling back in. 2003, and you have it here in Skellix Hall, which was published by the Lilliput Press in 2019, edited by Mary Shine Thompson, and that is what I will read from today. A story is told about the day when the first shore end was brought onto the beach in the spring of 1875. The big ship manoeuvred as close to the beach as possible, taking advantage of the high water peak of a spring tide. The cumbersome heavy cable was coiled onto flat, raft-like boats, which would float into shallow water. Large numbers of peasantry were assembled on the beach, watching the wonder of a transatlantic cable being brought ashore. The foreman in charge of the operation had harnessed two local draft horses to a rope attached to the end of the cable. All went well until strain was applied to the rope and, helped by a gentle swell, the nearest float to the shore overturned, spilling the coiled cable into six feet of water. At this stage, the horses proved very ineffective because of soft sand. The foreman, being a very astute person, stumbled on another bright idea. Seeing the potent pulling power of the large crowd, he proceeded to bargain with them. Every able-bodied man who would help Pull the cable ashore was to be paid two shillings and six pence. He would need forty men, and as an incentive, the first man who would lay hands on the cable was to be given a half sovereign in gold. No sooner said than done. The hired men rushed headlong into the broken wave where the cable lay. One man outstripped them all with a mighty leap and dived into the sea. Grasping the end, he tore it loose from the coil and helped by the rest of the hired team, pulled the cable up the sandy beach in front of the cable buildings. True to his word, the foreman paid each person 
two and sixpence. And calling for the man who merited the gold coin, asked for his name and address. The man in question was Dennis O'Leary from Ballinskellys. In presenting him with the coin and holding O'Leary's arm aloft in a gesture of victory, the foreman announced that henceforward the cable would be called Cable O'Leary. The name stuck not on the cable but on Dennis, who was known as the cable from then on. The next generation inherited the name and to this day their progeny are referred to as the Cable O'Learys. When the cable station closed down as a working cable station, um, the cable was diverted to Cornwall. Now, the building itself was a fine building, and it was, uh, the building was there on where the uh, Caravan Park is now in Banskellix. It was built by a London-based company. Uh, the physical structure was of mass concrete, and it was on three or four acres of ground, and that ground was walled. It had a main office and a clock tower, um, and like by, the, uh, by that time, it was a very modern building uh, in comparison with the houses of the local community. You had running water which came down um, gravity from Canard. You had septic tank, sewerage and bathroom, hot and cold water. Um, lighting was provided by gas and um, as most of the workers were Protestant, they had their own church and a bell. And amazingly enough, they had a fire fighting system which uh, used um, water, if they needed to be, it would use the water which would be pumped from the sea. The games they played were um, cricket and uh, tennis. And um, you can see the comparison with the local community where the local games would be Gaelic football. And as I say, the building itself it provided a great contrast with the living conditions of the local people at the, at the time where most of the buildings would be small thatched houses. And then it provided a certain amount of employment. Um, it had, uh, they had their own um, mode of transport, um, a, a horse-drawn carriage, and they had a stable man, a carriage man, a lighting man and a battery man and they had four domestic service servants. The vegetables were all provided locally, which gave a certain amount of income locally. And then the meat was provided by Michal and Vostera here in Dungagin, where Skolvi Hill is um, at the moment. Now, um, as I say, the, the, bill, the, the cable station and the post office finished um, in 1923 and the building then was taken over by the Irish government and during the 1920s it was run as an Irish college it was a famous Irish college nationally well known and um, it was basically set up to um, train um, uh, teachers but many other people also attended the college um, a future politician like Jack Lynch the Bolins and the Collies. And it is reputed that it's here in Banskelly's College that Jack Lynch met his wife Maureen. Now, be Shano Connell, Shano Connell, a Vimar Hanachi, Sakhalash to Shin, and as we share Mar Hanachi own, good you go worship your boss, Sibleen, and Lady got took a hair. So we call Nashon to Aaron Glash to Shin, and Kalash to Marat to have you and the, um, the um, college continued until the late 40s. Now, it was, uh, the um, building itself was overseen by the Board of Public Works and the Board of Public Works were not prepared to meet the maintenance and upkeep of the building. And unfortunately, and to the regret of the Balanced Kelly's community, the Board of Works knocked the building in the late 50s. 
which was a shame when you see the fine buildings that um, remained in Valencia and in Waterford, the fine cable station buildings. The only building that was left standing was that part which became the guard station afterwards and which is now in, um, in private property. Now, I, the buildings closed down and the, as I said the building was knocked but this cable station have left a legacy here in Banskellix and through the cable station a lot, um, a number of people came in to work on the cable stations and settled here. Two of the families being uh, the Mains, who uh, down through the years um, ran the Sagasson Adam Hotel and the post offices here in Banskellix. And also the Browns, the Brown family, they came in through the cable station. John Brown, who came from Scotland, he came in to the cable station in Waterford and worked as a gas fitter and a plumber. And then his son Joe, he worked as a, tele a telegrapher here in Baden Skellix. And we can see that the Browns are still making a major contribution to uh, the community and society here in Baden Skellix, providing us with a, a well stocked shop and a um, post office. And Nicholas and his son providing uh, a plant hire service which is used all over the county. So they are some of the legacy legacies that the cable station have left us here in Bandeskelix. So Shine Mushkiel and Atasuligum go Winshift Hanimas Garimila Magriff. The earliest repair ship involved in cable laying that I can remember was a ship called the Buccaneer. I heard my father say that a pilot from Valencia named Macron would come overland to Ballon Skellix, where a local crew awaited him at the old fishing pier to meet the ship as she rounded into the mouth of Ballon Skellix Bay. My father, being one of the crew, told me how the pilot would sit in the stern and steer them towards the ship and he would chant a little rhyme in rhythm with each oar stroke. Pull, boys, pull, there's smoke off the bull. Meaning, of course, that he, the pilot, saw the black smoke from her funnels appearing near the bull rock. The Great Eastern was the ship that lay the cable through the deepest part of the Atlantic and only came to the mouth of the bay where the shore end, leading to Balanskelix Beach, was connected to the Atlantic through a smaller diameter cable. I remember seeing a ship called the Colonia and a smaller inshore repair ship, Lady of the Isles. The Lord Kelvin was a great 4,000 tonner. Other ships of 1,000 tons were the John W. McKay, the George Ward and the Mary Louise McKay. Those latter named ships were all used for coastal repair. And I remember my father telling a story about going out and going on board some of those repair ships. It was at the end of World War II and uh, goods, foods and oil, you know, were rationed at the time. And he spoke about taking out nylon stockings, ladies' nylon stockings, and exchanging them for tea and for oil, oil for their lamps. <laughs> 